Okay, good evening and welcome to our Australian Reading Hour event, Representation Matters. My name is Leanne Sajadi and I'm from the Vision Australia Library. Behind me is a Vision Australia banner with our logo and the words Blindness Vision Opportunity. We are a national public library service for people who are blind, have low vision or a print disability. We welcome our members here, as well as staff, volunteers and friends, particularly from the library and publishing community. This is an important conversation for us and we were delighted to be invited to partner with Australia Reads to host this event. This connection was facilitated through our friends at Burbe Publishing, with whom we have recently released the Big Vision Picture Book Series, a significant contribution to the children's book market representing positive role models who are blind and have low vision. Today's event has been moved to online only, and I am broadcasting from the lands of the Wadawurrung people west of Nam Melbourne. The Vision Australia Library and Australia Reads acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we are all joining from across Australia. The Vision Australia Library pays our respects to elders, past, present and emerging, recognising their rich history over tens of thousands of years as the original storytellers of this land. And our library is committed to the telling of First Nations stories and supporting the traditions of oral storytelling. Our conversation today will be facilitated by the fabulous Sally Rippon, who I will introduce in a moment. This event is being recorded and the recording will be made available on the Vision Australia YouTube channel in the coming week. There will be time at the end of today's conversation for questions. You are welcome to pop questions and comments into either the chat or Q&A function in Zoom while the conversation is taking place. If you're using a screen reader, you can access the chat function using Alt-H on Windows or Command-Shift-H on a Mac. I'm now delighted to introduce today's moderator, Sally Rippon, and our panel. Sally Rippon is Australia's highest selling female author, having written more than 50 books for children and young adults that are beloved around the globe. She is a passionate ambassador for the 100 Story Building Creative Writing Centre and is a sought after teacher and writing mentor. Her most recent book is Wild Things, How We Learn to Read and What Can Happen If We Don't. We also welcome on our panel, Eliza Hull, Andy Jackson and Matt Formston. Eliza Hull is an award-winning musician, writer and disability advocate. She's the creator and editor of the anthology, We've Got This, Stories by Disabled Parents, as well as co-authoring the delightful picture book, Come Over to My House with Sally Rippon, which authentically portrays families with disability. Andy Jackson is an award-winning poet, most recently having won the Prime Minister's Literary Award for Poetry for his 2022 collection, Human Looking. He is a creative writing teacher and tutor and has edited disability-themed issues of the literary journal Southerly and Australian Poetry Journal. Finally, Matt Formston is a world champion and world record-breaking paracyclist and surfer. You may have seen him recently chasing big waves in Portugal. He is head of sustainability and corporate social responsibility for Optus and is the first protagonist featured in Vision Australia's Big Vision picture book series with the book Surfing in the Dark, which also means he has had the honour of being illustrated by Philip Bunting. We welcome you all and I now hand over to Sally. Thank you so much, Leanne. I'm so happy to be here in Nam and to speak to these um, incredible panellists who have all got these amazing books. Matt's book is, has come out, is coming out next week, I believe. And just having the opportunity to, to read stories about people who live different lives to us is such an important thing to contribute to our children's book collection. Um, Andy is a writer for adults, but later on, we're going to hear a little bit from all of the books. But I'll start with you, Matt, because we chatted a little bit earlier today. And I realized that you said that you didn't actually grow up as a reader. And from what you told me, I think if I remember this correctly, you were actually one of the first blind children to go through mainstream education. Can you explain why your parents made that decision to, to put you into a mainstream school and how that affected you and, and what were the benefits of that, do you think? Thanks, Sally. I, um, so I was at a mainstream school already when I lost my vision. So I started kindergarten 
and I, um, I lost my vision halfway through the year. So the choice was to either leave that school or to uh, and to put me uh, into a, a, a special school for children with disabilities um, or to leave me in the mainstream school. And they went to and checked out a few of the special schools and asked a few of the asked questions of those schools like what's what's the uh, what's the educate like what are the achievements of the students what, what sort of you know what level are they coming out with and they made a decision based on the the, the, the social um, what they saw as the social output of those children at those schools and the education output and made the made the, ran the the gauntlet that it was going to be a better outcome for me it would be challenging and that the community and the uh, education system wasn't set up to support me but they wanted to try and, and find that way so I, and obviously it was local so I stayed in, in my mainstream school because it was five minutes from my house whereas the special school was about a 40 minute drive from our house which would have been a challenge for the whole family so they they made that choice for me to go through mainstream schooling. And do you one of the things that um, I'm going to hold up your book now to camera it's a beautiful blue book with an illustration of you on the front funnily enough you were telling us earlier that your child said that it can't be you because in fact you put your other foot first yeah. but it's illustrated by Philip Bunting and there's a picture of a man on the front on a surfboard but one of the really interesting things about this book is that not only is there text in there but there's also braille how do you think that could be a useful thing for children in a picture book? Look, I, I'm so proud to have been featured in this book and in this series by Vision Australia. Um, but I'm super proud that it's got text. It's the first book in Australia and one of the first in the world that is that has text and Braille in the same edition. So a, a family that has children that are sighted and visually impaired can all read the one edition. Uh, or, a, you know, a, a grandparents and grandchildren can read the same book, either blind or sighted. But I think it's also a really great opportunity for people that aren't blind and, not, and aren't normally familiar with the, the visually impaired community to be exposed to Braille. So you could go to your local library, pick up a copy of this book and read it and, and obviously still enjoy the book, but at the same time be exposed to Braille and touch the touch the page and see how a person that can't see might be, be able to read the same edition. Yeah, it's really fascinating. And um, Andy and Eliza, um, you've both, well, Eliza, you and I have collaborated also on a picture book, which I'll hold up to camera and, and just show people, where it actually, um, we go into the home of, oh, I'm not doing well because it's wrong word. Uh, we go into the home of lots of families of children with disabilities, including a blind family. Um, and there's a small child on the front in a wheelchair. And I know from having read your story in your adult book, we've got this, that you did spend some time as a child in primary school in a wheelchair. What was that experience like for you? And, and did you find the school a supportive environment for a child in a wheelchair? Um, yeah, so that's right. Uh, so um, I have a disability that's called Shaako Mari 2. And um, throughout different times in primary school and high school, I was a wheelchair user. Uh, and I think um, for the most part, teachers was, were really great. And um, there's actually, you know, one story that I often remember of going to camp and them not really thinking about how inaccessible the camp was going to be. But when I arrived, my teacher not letting me sit out and watch instead he asked whether it would be okay if he lifted me so that I could be with the other kids. And I said, yes. And so suddenly there I was um, on the beach in the sand using my wheelchair and splashing in the waves. And it became a really enjoyable experience. And it really changed how the, the other children saw my disability because he'd enabled me to be part of everything else going on and I you know look back in such a positive way on, on a way that a teacher can make a real small change and just saying you know I don't want you to sit out I want you to be part of this um, but yeah I think school grounds are often really inaccessible so I definitely found it hard to get in and out of classrooms during those times. Mm. And what was school like for you Andy? Do you have fond memories of school or not such a great great place? Um, no not great memories, to be honest, Sally. Um, look, my experience of school was pretty straightforward when I was in primary. Um, you know, I was pretty geeky. I, I, I did a lot of reading. Um, and so that was kind of lovely. Uh, teenage years for me uh, meant puberty and puberty meant growth spurts. And for people with uh, the condition Marfan syndrome, which is what I have, that can often mean um, 
your bones going into and your joints going into shapes that are unusual. So I have a pretty noticeable spinal curvature and it was getting quite severe when I was in my teenage years. So, uh, you know, as they all say, kids can be really cruel and they are, it's true. Um, Cause we're all trying to work out who we are and where we fit in. And we want to think of ourselves as normal and maybe someone else is not normal. So it, it can be pretty brutal as a, as a young person. Uh, that kind of drove me further into thinking about writing and reading and, you know, we're trying to work it all out. So, you know, there were silver linings to that. And yeah, I met some fantastic people after that. Yeah. And Matt, you uh, mentioned to me earlier that because reading wasn't a skill that was available to you, it actually gave you the opportunity to develop other skills that you've used later in life. Can you talk a little bit to this and, and about how um, potentially if there's one skill taken from us that it can just heighten the other skills that we have? Yeah, I've been talking a bit about this recently with people and, you know, we, we all, uh, and, and to Andy's point around, you know, we're, we're all different and we all want to be normal. As, mm. in, as business people, we want to create differentiation with our products and our services. But then when we all mm. talk to each other, like maybe in an interview situation, we're all trying to be the same and be part of that cookie cutter. But for me, really looking at what makes me me, I had opportunities that potentially you could look at as not opportunities, like I couldn't read and I I chose not to read Braille because it wasn't wasn't cool. Um, so I couldn't literally did not read at all through school. My whole school education was through listening and talking and asking questions. Um, but so I mean, you could look at that and say, "Well, that poor child." But uh, you, no one on listening right now could possibly have the experience that I have in listening and asking questions. Um, mm -hmm. So as when it came to my career, my corporate career, I was way ahead of the curveball because I've, I'm an expert in listening and asking questions. So. I think you can look at it on a negative side and say, you know, woe is me, I didn't get to read, but also I got to listen and I'm now very good at that skill. Yeah, and it talks about that in your book too, doesn't it, about that is actually how you got by in the classroom by asking lots of questions and not being afraid to make mistakes and learning from those mistakes. It feels like you had a very um, naturally quite um, resilient attitude and you say that your parents were very supportive of this, that if you were going to do something, you had to do it well. Um, <laughs> is that something that you do in all aspects of your life? Yeah, so... The, the, um... I think a lot of people talk about, like, think about what happened with me as my parents were were pushy parents and you have to do things well. But the, the narrative was more around, like, you can't, not using the word can't. So not saying I can't do that because I'm blind. So you, I can't ride a bike or I can't do this. They say, dad would say, well, why can't you do that? That's that's just an excuse. If you choose to do it, let's find a way. So he was a sales guy. He, he ran sales and market. He was a sales and marketing executive for large alcohol companies. So he, he, he was talking and, you know, going through solutions with people every day. So he, you know, it was very difficult to try and talk him out of something. Um, but yeah, it was like the, the whole thing was you can choose to not do it if you want, that's fine, but you call it out. Say, I don't want to do that data. Or I don't have in energy in into that data. Or I don't want to do it. And we, then we talk through that or I do want to do it. And then we just find a way. So that was, that was an hour. And then the whole, well, whilst that's happening in my, in my household, the world was telling my parents, you know, Matt's blind now. He can't, he won't play able to play school. He won't have an education. He won't be able to have a career. Basically his life's, you know, what you thought your child's life would look like doesn't exist anymore. And that at school they're saying, you can't play football. You can't do these things. So the whole world was telling me we can't, but then I played football and then I played ice hockey and then I was just, I was surfing. And so my whole life experience was the world saying you can't, but then I did. So I didn't trust what the world was saying. So um, there was there was a number of things going on, but it set me up to be like, well, if I really want to do something, I'll just do it. <laughs> so obviously the key is to tell you can't do something and then you'll do it. Well, when I was young, that was definitely like a red rag to a ball. But these days I'm a bit more considered about what I what I take on. Just, I just haven't got enough time to do it all. Yeah. yeah. Eliza, you um, edited a really beautiful book. We've got this, which is interviews with lots of parents living with disabilities. One of the things that I found particularly moving in reading the book uh, the interviews within the book are how many parents living with disabilities are shamed and, and basically discouraged from having children. Can you talk a little bit about this and what your experience was when you decided to have a child? Um, yeah, so uh, 
the reason that I wanted to create the book is is because um, you know just what Matt was saying is I, I think that disability has been portrayed in the media as a negative and um, that really I guess instilled in me that disability was something I should hide uh, and it wasn't really until I decided to start a family that I really noticed how much needs to change and especially in the medical world uh from in my experience I uh had been seeing a neuro neurologist for uh quite a while actually over over 10 years if not more um and uh had you know seen him every now and then and went to him for a medical advice and said that I was wanting to start a family and he said that I he didn't think that I really should and and he didn't think that I'd be able to manage and uh, I remember that really filling me with a lot of doubt about my capabilities as a parent. Uh, and so when I searched online for um, wanting just to really know what it would be like to be a parent with a disability, I noticed there was a real lack of um, stories mm -hmm. and anecdotes and information. And uh, that was why I wanted to create the We've, we've Got This book so that for future, uh, you know, people like mm. me that were wanting to start a family that had a disability, that they could have a book like this to show them that, you know, even if you are told by a medical professional that actually we as disabled people do make great parents. Um, but, yeah, I think discrimination is still happening and, you know, especially for parents with intellectual disability um, and also parents that are blind and parents that are deaf, um, there really needs to be a lot of changes in the medical space in, in terms of attitudes so why so this the topic of this talk is why representation is important do you feel like that's something that um is, it, is, it, is an important thing that we start off with children is introducing them to stories of people with disability like the one that's been published about matt and also come over to my house so that we grow up seeing these people around us so it becomes less something that's unusual to, to come across people with disability. Why, why do you think um, either, let's start with you, Andy, why do you think um, disability is important to be represented in literature? Oh, look, I think one of the huge reasons for me is pretty much very much what Eliza was just saying about, you know, you, you do a survey and you look around and you, especially when you're younger, or a pivotal moment in your life, you do look around and try to find stories and articles and poems that connect with your own experience. And I certainly realised a couple of decades ago that there were very few out there that I resonated with. And so it's, it's getting as many different stories out there as possible because very often people with disability or with um, physical difference, uh, with chronic illness, they're often not allowed to tell their own stories. And so, and that's not just about who has the right to say it or not, but it's about the truth of the story because, um, yeah, we're in a much better place to talk about the reality of what it's like, both the difficulties and the huge insights and the skills that come with the sort of territory we have to navigate. So, um, yeah, I think it's about getting expanding the really narrow uh, ideas that are out there. Do you want to add to that, Eliza? I can see you nodding. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, yes, I just, yeah, I like everything Andy said. Um, I think, I, you know, if I talk about something that's happening right now in my life, so I have a physical disability, so it means that when I move around the world, I, I move very differently. And right now I also have a broken leg that's just started to heal. And so I'm using um, cr crutches and I just have noticed um, how people see injury versus disability. So, for instance, mm -hmm. I've been getting a lot of taxis and they often will say to me what I'm telling them about my broken leg, well, at least you're not disabled, like at least... At least you know, at least this is going to end. It's just an injury. And I I still see it so much in, in life today and society today that we are okay when it's an injury that's ending or, or that it's going to be just something that's fleeting, whereas disability is still seen as something that 
mm-hmm. is yeah is a deficit something that is problematic something that we wouldn't don't want to be part of um and i think that that's why it is so important that young children are exposed to uh you know picture books and stories and even just conversations in the home about disabilities so that we can change the way that society uh, feels about disability. And really, when we think about it, these people are little people that it will become big people and they are the future. And hopefully they'll bit by bit create more of an accessible world for, for us and for the future. So I, I hope that we're just creating incredible thinkers for the future and how we can change the world. And I think reading really is an act of empathy, isn't it? It's the only opportunity or listening to people's stories where you can understand what it's like to be someone else. And I know certainly in your uh, book, Matt, um, it does really have this sense of, you know, if if you work really hard, you can almost achieve anything. And I'm just going to read out the last little bit, um, which I'd love you to comment on, where it says, Matt says, people ask me if I could go back to being five years old and choose to be sighted would I do it? My eyesight has driven me to take all the opportunities that have come my way. I would keep my disability because it made me who I am. So it feels like the message that is coming out in this book and certainly the story and the the way that you're role modelling for other kids is a really positive one. Were there times when you were younger that potentially you didn't feel so strong about these things? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's a bit, that's a challenge. You know, we talk about, and the, the book focuses on my achievements as an athlete and I, you know, when I'm talking, doing keynote speaking, a lot of the time it's about my, my, my highlights as an athlete and as a businessman. But in reality, the challenges is really where the good stuff is. And that, that's, you know, the dark stuff that all the, that's where I've taken all my learnings in life. And that's where um, I suppose I've built resilience, which makes me the person I am. Um, but just going back to your point as well about the, uh, the, the, the representation, I think it's super important because of, uh, no, like the word normalizing people are really scared to talk about disability so for international day of people with disabilities last year i posted if you want to do anything for to help the disability community just have a conversation about it because people walk up to me i'm blind um i'm a public figure so i'm like it's not as if i'm embarrassed about the fact that i'm blind it's out there people, people don't know what to say they're like oh you're, you're blind and they stutter and they can't they're just it's very mm-hmm. awkward for people and you can tell that even people have the the right intentions they just are not comfortable with disability. I think if we all get comfortable with the fact it is a disability, something doesn't work with my body, but that's given me experiences to, to build other components of my life. Um, and I'm very comfortable with the fact that I have a disability and that will allow other people with disabilities that aren't necessarily, it's new to them or they're still developing that comfort. Um, and then pet their, the community around them to, to be more comfortable just to talk to them about it. And once we're once disability becomes more normalized and you can get in a taxi and have a broken leg and not have the taxi driver say, oh, at least you don't have a disability, I think th- the whole community will be a lot more supportive and have a lot more opportunities for people with disabilities. Mm. Yeah, that's a really good point. I've learned a lot through working with you over the last few years, Eliza, and we're very good friends, so I feel very comfortable asking you lots of questions. But does it ever become tiresome to have people ask about your disability all the time? And is that potentially what the role of books can be so that you don't have to always answer people's questions? And and is it ever inappropriate for people to ask you questions? Do you want to comment on that, first of all, Eliza? Yeah, I think it's, wow, it's a good question. I don't know if I can answer that completely honestly because it's, it can really depend on the day and who and where and what. <laughs> and um, But I think for the most part, I actually feel like it's quite purposeful to talk about disability. And because for many years I did hide it whenever I could, I didn't like um, when people would stare or um, ask questions. Whereas now, because I am uh, seeing what needs to change in the world and, and want to change and shift attitudes, I feel like it has felt purposeful um but yeah look there are times when it can feel too much and um you know especially if you're just wanting to you know get about your you know day um but again I think it always depends on how it's it's asked and and um yeah whether it comes from a good place ultimately Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
What do you think, Andy? You've got a beautiful poem that I'm hoping you'll read later that talks particularly about the way that children react to people with disability. Has that created awkward moments yeah. for you or are you quite open to children uh, asking the questions? Oh, look, it's it, similar to what Liza was saying. I, it, it's case by case. And, you know, I think so often my experience has been that kids are really curious and curiosity is something that you want to foster and not, you know, squash down because squashing down curiosity creates a kind of shame um, and which is horrible. It's really what we want to avoid. So um, when I have had kids actually, you know, maybe their parent has encouraged them to come over and ask something of me, uh, I actually don't mind that. I think that's kind of a really good opportunity I'm not always in the mood, but um, I think it's a really good opportunity. And it's so interesting how nine times out of 10, um, the answer to the question is kind of boring to children. <laughs> you know, they, they want to know how I got to be the shape I am. And then when I tell them, you know, my spine's a bit different shape, they sort of blank out and drift off and want to go and get a lolly. So in the end, a lot of this stuff is, is made bigger than it should be, um, especially around visible difference and there's all different kinds of disabilities and everyone has their own response to how they feel about being in the public eye but um you know yeah i i think it's an opportunity and if there's the right spirit taken towards it from both sides it can be a, a huge opportunity yeah and i guess in some ways you've all in different ways are advocating for the disability community just even by being public figures and writing and putting your ideas into text would you mind choosing a poem, Andy? So for people who didn't hear the introduction, Andy's wonderful collection of poetry, the most recent one, recently won the Prime Minister's Award. And um, there are some just quite heartbreaking poems in there about a lot of the surgeries that people with disabilities may have to go through and some of the pain and the discomfort. Um, but I certainly found it incredibly enlightening to, to see the world through this perspective. And so I do think that is such a gift that, that you've given to us. So do you mind reading one? Yeah. Thanks, Sally. It's really beautiful words. Thank you. Um, I'd like to read a short poem called The Change Room. Uh, this one is set at a swimming pool, which I think is one of those beautiful, intimate, democratic spaces that we can have as, as humans, or it should be. Um, so this is called The Change Room. This morning, walking almost naked from the change room towards the outdoor heated pool, I become that man again, unsettling shape to be explained. Such questions aren't asked to my face. Children don't mean anything by it, supposedly, so I shouldn't feel as I do, as my bones crouch into an old shame I thought I'd left behind. Chlorine prickling my nostrils, a stranger compliments me on my tattoos and shows me hers a dove in flight over a green peace sign, as if the canvas was unremarkable. She turns and limps away, and something makes a moment of sense. I lower myself into our element and swim, naturally asymmetrical and buoyant. Quite some time later, showering, the man beside me is keen to chat. How many laps we've each done, how long I've lived in this town, the deep need for movement. Speaking, our bodies become solid. Thank you. Beautiful. So Pleasure. What are some of the things that um, people have responded to in your poetry? Do you, you talked a little bit about um, when we were chatting before this interview that disability isn't straightforward or simple, but fluid and complex and relevant for everyone. How do you think that a book that is particularly talking about disability can be relevant to everybody. Yeah, look, um, I'm always surprised how, um, and maybe this is something about poetry because sometimes poetry is really intimate and really complicated. So people, when they're reading it, uh, want to find their own way in through their own experience. And so for a lot of people, when they read my poems and maybe anyone else's, they kind of start identifying with what's being depicted and they start thinking about their own experience. And even if it's not the same, they start imagining what, what that could be possibly be like. So I think what I've, 
wanted to do and what people seem to respond to is poems that have some empathy to them, but also uh, that empathy is like helping people to realise that they don't know it all and starting to imagine what another life might be like. So, and people can imagine difference, you know. Uh, there are some extremes of difference that we all know about and experience, but kind of most people know something about what it's like to feel on the outside. And so I think maybe I'm sort of tapping into that and people who appreciate what I'm doing have a sense of outsiderness and wanting to learn more. So, yeah, I think it's about that stuff, yeah. I can certainly identify with the outsider thing. I think a lot of people <laughs> have that, that feeling. Matt, what would you like children to take away from your book? It's um, coming out next week. It's, it's a beautifully illustrated hardback book. It tells your story in particular, but how do you think it might reach other kids who potentially live with other types of disabilities? Uh, look, you, you always hope with your, it's a very, um, very egotistical thing having a book written about you or having any sort of content created about you. Um, so for me, when I think for any of this stuff, I, I hope that it can help a family that may have a child. Like actually today, through some stuff from social media, there was a, a lady that reached out whose 13 year old son who surfs um, has had a brain cancer that's affected his optic nerve and he's lost his vision. Uh, and then they're saying that through my story that he has hoped that once he comes out of his uh, you know, his treatment, that there's a life on the other side for him. So th there's just stories like that that th you think, well, if my story can help a family or help a child or um, or help give someone that doesn't have a disability and maybe doesn't understand difference, can have exposure to the fact that there are different people in the world and that there's different pathways. Um, uh, yeah, either, either either giving someone hope or giving someone education, they're, they're the things that I would hope this, this, this book will bring. Mm -hmm. And Eliza, you've become quite a vocal advocate, not only in the um, literary world, but also as a musician. I know um, you were campaigning, for example, to have a ramp at the ARIA Awards and so many just basic things like that that would make the world easier for other people. What are some of the things that you think would be important to look into? What kind of stories would you like to see published if we're speaking to publishers out there um, so that people understand how to make the world more supportive for people with disabilities so that they can reach their potential. Um, yeah, look, I think just more stories like the one that just come out of with Matt in it. Like I read that to my kids this week and it was, yeah, really, it really resonated with me, um, especially just when it spoke about how, what, like as you mentioned, that um, Matt doesn't want to change his disability. I think that that kind of statement is probably one that's kind of progressive at the moment in terms of where we were uh it shouldn't be progressive in fact I think we're actually moving into a space where it, it's not um but it, from when I was growing up in the 80s it certainly was so I think that I think the kid my children so I've got a two-year-old and an eight-year-old they in my opinion are pretty lucky to be living in a world where we are having these conversations and we are seeing more and more of these books. But I guess what I just want to say is I just want more of them. <laughs> and for me, I think that there still isn't enough. And uh, I think just the experiences of, of, of various disabilities as well and showing that disability doesn't just look like one thing, that it can look like all sorts of things. And um, that I think that's an interesting way for children to learn that that so I, I hope that we see more books like that definitely and one of the things I learned I have learned through working with you Eliza um, and you taught me a lot I so I have a, a son who has found uh, school very different because he's neurodivergent he's ADHD and dyslexic which we think of as an invisible disability but can definitely create some hurdles to towards some um, Assessing a, a mainstream education and there are lots of things we can put in place to support kids like this can you summarise what you taught me about what the medical model of disability is as opposed to the, the um, social model so that people are aware of, of this way of thinking? Yeah, I think that was a great conversation that we had around uh, your son. I just said, does he identify as having a disability? 
and you you weren't sure um you said probably not and then I spoke to you about the social model of disability and I guess that is very different from the medicalized model where you know the medical model is just kind of as it it states that it's seen as a deficit it's seen as something that ought to be fixed um it's medicalized uh whereas the social model really speaks to the world needing to change and um you know having braille in in children's books having auslan interpreters um for people that are deaf uh having image descriptions um for people that are blind or have low vision and for me it's the physical space um so having ramps and um when I you know start to tell my children about that that I think that was for them as well as me a real ah okay so it's not actually the person that needs to change in fact if we do create a more accessible world that we will feel uh, more included and that's when we actually start to really see attitudes shift because we are there more included in, in a more accessible world. Mm-hmm. One of the things we hope to do with this picture book that, um, that we worked on together was actually to show what that world would look like. Would you mind reading a little bit of that? Yeah, so come over to my house. Yeah. Yep. I didn't know whether you were talking with... We're working on a second book, would you believe? <laughs> oh, uh, <laughs> so I'm, um, yeah, holding it, come over to my house up now. And um, on this page, uh, you see a mother uh, reading using Braille. And it says, come over to my house. You can bring your own book. We have a whole library. You're welcome to look. But mum's books are different to ones you can read. She reads with her fingers at such a great speed. And the mother is uh, sitting on a chair reading to three children using Braille and um, there's a dog asleep in the background. Our dog is called Sam. You can tickle her tummy, but not when she's working. She needs to help mummy. And then there's a uh, mum is walking with using a seeing eye dog and Then the second page is all the children tickling Sam's tummy. Sam walks with mum when she's out for the day, but when they get home, then Sam likes to play. That's Mm -hmm. just, yeah, one of the uh, families in come over to my house and there's, yeah, lots of different families. So there's a a family that has a child that's a wheelchair user, um, a family that have dwarfism, uh, a family that or, or are autistic and uh, a family with a mother um, that has an intellectual disability and also another family that has a mother that's deaf. So certainly since I've started working with you, Eliza, I've become much more aware of the disability community. I don't know if I see it more because now um, I'm more aware of it, but it feels like people who are really getting their time in the sun uh, Auslan interpreters. I don't know. It like every concert there are clips of Auslan interpreters just rocking out and um, <laughs> amazing time. So do you feel like since you were, I'll get you all to comment on this studying with you, Andy, if you don't mind, do you feel like um, that visibility around disability is, is changing from when you were a child and, and how, how does that make you feel different in the world? Yeah, look, it, it, it has changed a lot in the last couple of decades, hugely. Um, it's gone to from, I guess, you know, uh, charity specials uh, to, yeah, um, authors, uh, dancers, theatre practitioners, journalists, all sorts of people, sportsmen, sportswomen, all sorts of people really being visible. And the difference is huge because the gap is so huge. So uh, I think there's a lot of space to go, a lot of, lot of uh, change that still needs to happen. But that, that shift where we're starting to, for people to, like just the diversity of our society being reflected a little bit more in the broader culture, that's really encouraging. Um, part of it is just a reassurance of, ah, well, actually, you know, I'm part of this as much as anyone else is. Uh, I, I belong as much as anyone else does. 
And so that's reassurance. And it's also this sense that, great, I don't have to write everything. <laughs> There's going to be other poets and other writers doing some of that work too, which is superb. That's great. And how about you, Matt? Have you seen um, ch attitudes change towards people with disabilities since you were a child? Look, so much. I, um, I mean, we've talked about the fact that I can't read, but Apple created accessibility and my phone reads things out to me. So in, when the, in whatever year it was, they introduced the 3GS, I could get my calendar. And, I, and when, I, when that first came out, the voiceover, it was weird. in meetings, people would be like, the whole meeting would stop if my phone read out at the time. But now people are like more comfortable with that. And, you know, we're the company I work for now, we're looking, we're changing all the bench heights in our, in our stores to accommodate for people in wheelchairs. And it's, it's a conversation at a corporate level. Now people realize that it's not just the right thing to do. It's also, uh, you know, it's a business opportunity because there is a, like, what is it? 30 something percent of the population have a disability. Um, so you need to service that whole market. So it's not just, it's not just big about awareness. It's also about, you know, it's becoming commercial. I think when things become commercial, that moves the needle a lot because then, then things become more accessible across the board. And what I'm hearing more and more from different communities is build build for disability. Because when you build for disability, you build for everyone. Um, so if you build a you know if you build a, a a shop entrance with a with a ramp, you're building it for people with a wheelchair, but also the old man with a cane. Um, and so yeah, definitely moving a lot. And I think the more of these conversations makes it more comfortable for people to talk about disability. And when people are comfortable talking about it, um, it, it the needle just keeps moving. Yeah, that's true. And it's a really interesting comment you make about the ramp, because I was listening to an interview with you, Eliza, last year, and you quoted somebody that you know who said, disability is one of the things none of us will escape as we get older. People will lose their hearing, their sight, potentially their mobility as well. And yet we're not talking about it. We're not seeing it as we um, as we grow up. And so potentially this does destigmatize it for, for older people as well. But going back to the idea of accessibility and technology, another thing that I've heard people in disability talk about is how equalizing the COVID lockdowns were, because now everybody's at home and having to check in to work or watch writers' festivals or concerts online. What are some of the, the changes that you think could happen there, Eliza? I know that you've been involved, quite heavily involved in advocating for a lot more of these venues to be accessible, but also to be to have things happen online. Can you chat a little bit about that? Yeah, I think you're right. I think that um, the pandemic, in my opinion, was a leveler because it meant that people, because like actually disabled people had been advocating and wanting that for a really long time. And yet when everybody else suddenly, you know, required that, it was an easy solution. So, um, you know, even doctor's appointments and medical appointments now being telehealth, again, that was something that disabled people had been advocating for for a long time. Now it's our, you know, reality. And uh, I think it's, you know, a great accessibility um, tool for all of us really, isn't it? And and for, I always like to talk about how, the things that are, you know, potentially beneficial for disabled people can be beneficial for a lot of other people as well, um, you know, parents or pregnant people. Uh, so I think this way that we are, you know, even having an online event like this, um, hybrid working situations or flexible working situations, they're all things that have been a real positive since the pandemic. Uh, but the only thing I'm not seeing is the continuation of that with live music as much. So that's a real shame. Uh, so a lot of um, shows and gigs was, was live streamed. I did a live stream myself um, interviewing other disabled artists around the world. And there was a, a, a kind of online festival called Isolated Festival that happened where musicians could perform. And then major concerts were also streamed, like even the huge artists. And then we're not really seeing that as much because it costs a lot of money, I guess, is probably the, the main oh. reason. Uh, and tourism, you know, getting people out again, tourism mm. is all things that people gen generally now lean towards. Uh, so I, yeah, I'm a real advocate for bringing that back, in my opinion. I just think having that model that we can go and see live music if we want in person 
but that having that option of being able to you know be at home or wherever we are and uh, is such a great accessibility feature and it sounds like a lot of the work you do matt is talking to businesses about how this can actually be a viable option and, and actually a good alternative so when it comes down to money that potentially there are things to be made by reaching a wider audience so you know whether it's people with living with disability or people living in regional areas or even just reaching people who, like you say, are, are stuck at home for various reasons. So um, it does feel like there's, there's a big future ahead for people listening out there. Um, I'm hoping that some of the people listening out there might actually like to chime in and ask some questions now, particularly of the panellists. I know Leanne is going to give me a hand here reading some of them out or um, potentially giving people the opportunity to ask them live. Um, but while we're waiting for some questions, I wonder if... Matt, Andy, or Eliza have questions of anyone else on the panel that I haven't thought of? I just, just while I think of it, um, yeah, what, what reminded me from what Eliza was just saying there is that um, it'd be, it's great to have representation uh, among, you know, musicians and writers and uh, all sorts of people. It's also good to have people behind the scenes making decisions about what gets published, uh, how we present a work, uh, what the venue is like. Because if they're more likely to be disabled, then it's going to be more likely to have the right kind of decisions made about who gets to be there. So that's the other side of representation, I think, which is worth thinking about. Uh, I think really that comes back to the whole concept of build for all. Like it's not just building a, a building for everyone. If you build your business, your, your, your concert for everyone, then you build for disability, then you build it for everyone. If you anything you build, if you build a, a mouse for someone with a disability, you build it for everyone. And if we go back to anything we do, any process we build or any product we build, if we include all disabilities when we do that, then we include every, all the different ages, everything when we do that. Do you want to add anything to that, Eliza? Um, yeah, I just, I guess I, one thing that I've been having to push up against constantly is people saying, we don't need a ramp because we don't have a disabled person at the event or we don't, yeah, those kind of, yeah. we don't need an Auslan interpreter because we don't have any deaf people coming. Well, like that to me is problematic because the reason that you don't have people that are deaf coming to your event is because you don't have an Auslan interpreter. So like that's what I'm trying to kind of, yeah advocate for or you know for instance the arias not having a ramp up onto the stage they don't want a ramp because there's there's not a person with disability nominated to use that ramp well that's a problem in itself and the reason that that is a problem is because those people watching the broadcast at home look at it and think you know if they're a wheelchair user or have you know um a physical disability they just see it as a as they're not welcome that's not something that they will be able to even access. So I feel like we need to actually have access at you know, the forefront of all of our minds, even potentially if it's needed, which I, I disagree with anyway. But, um, yeah, so I feel like it's, it's those kind of decisions that need to start to change how we see um, access. Absolutely. Right. How are we going, Leanne? Would you like to ask a question? Yeah, sure. So just a reminder, you can pop questions into the Q&A or into the chat. Um, or if you'd like to ask a question live, you can raise your hand and we will give you permission to speak. Um, I have a question. I'm a librarian um, and I know many of the people who joined us today um, are from public libraries and from school libraries. Um, for those of us working in that space, what are some of the practical ways that libraries can support representation in you know, both our collections and in our programming. Do you want to start with that, Andy? Yeah, the, the only thing I'll mention is, it was very interesting. I, I'm, I'm doing an event for our local library, well, in Bendigo uh, next week, and they actually asked me, you know, uh, uh, what books of poetry should we buy? you know, I think, and that wasn't disability connected, but it was poetry connected and it's probably a similar marginalized community. Um, so sometimes librarians don't know where to start, but if they know one person, uh, that person will often know where else to go. So I think part of it is just 
being able to tap into those networks. Um, you know, each of us, I think, on this panel would have a, a huge list of books and authors and other people that we would recommend. So, yeah, it's partly about getting the word out. Yeah. And there are some really great resources online when you type it into Google. Um, there are people that are really great at collating lists and putting it all together. So if you just type it in, yeah, there's some great resources out there. And Matt, who would you recommend as a public speaker that would be a good person for us to, to watch? Oh, uh, probably me. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Um, who's a good disability public speaker? Um, Ellie Cole's pretty good. We've got Dylan Alcott as well. He's a Dylan, great... yep. yep. Lots of them. Mm. Yep. And Andy, is there a poet we should be reading that you'd like to recommend? Ah, uh, there's so many. I I wouldn't wouldn't quite know where to start. Um, I will say I'm putting together an anthology that's going to come out later this year, which is full of collaborative writing of poets with disabilities. So uh, that's something to look out for. It's going to be called Raging Grace. So there's a whole list of 20-something poets who will be in there. Fantastic. Sounds fabulous. And um, we do have a question from Britt McCarthy. Uh, she asks, what are everyone's favourite books? <laughs> I'm not going to start with you, Matt, because you've already said loud and proud. You're not a reader, but are there audible? Oh, look, audio I, books? I would challenge most people to have read more books than me on this call, audio books. Yeah. Do you have a favourite audio book, Matt? Um, I recommend Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell to people, but I've got lots of books, but that's one that I normally re I recommend a lot. Yeah, great. Andy? Whoa. Um, okay, so I, can I pass? I want to look up the okay, we'll name of the you. book that I was read last year, which was brilliant, so yep. Mental Blank. I'll come to you, Eliza, but before I do, I'd like to really recommend We've Got This, which is the collection of stories that Eliza edited. Yeah. And, um, you know, sometimes when I recommend books that are, are very thematic and so people might say, oh, I don't want to read a book about parenting or I don't want to read a book about people living with disability, um, it really narrows down the capacity to, to connect with people that live different lives to yourself. I mean, you can find a way to feel inspired or connected by people living very different circumstances to yours. And so certainly all the stories that I read in that collection, I found very moving as a parent um, and I don't live with a disability. So I think it's, it is important for people to remember that we're not writing for people with disabilities necessarily, even though that's important. People want to see themselves represented, but we're also just writing because these are interesting people in the world and, and we want to know their stories. Is there a book you'd recommend, Eliza, that you think like yeah, I think um, children's book, I'd re recommend uh, a book by James Catchpole. It's called What Happened to You? Um, and it's about a child mm. with limb difference and uh, lots of children around him asking what happened to him and what's what's wrong with him and him like pushing back on that and just wanting to play with the kids, the other kids. And then when they start to play with him and start pretending and, you know, make imaginary play they realize they don't actually really need to know what happened uh, so mm. yeah it's quite a great children's book um, in terms of an adult's book um, I, there's a really great book by Krista Couture um, and she's a Canadian uh, disabled writer and it's kind of about that how to lose everything and come out you know she lost three babies she lost her marriage she lost her leg um and yeah lots of things were kind of I guess in a way could be perceived as going against her she um yeah was really unwell and sick but then she kind of comes out at the other end and realizes that I guess builds resilience and realizes that potentially all those things were meant to happen because she of her outlook now and the way she sees the world and what she wants to change in the world. And then another one, sorry, is just I love this book. Um, it's uh, called Women Who Run With Wolves and it's kind of got lots of folklore uh, stories and it, it just kind of taps into that real creative self that can be really rebellious 
in a beautiful way. <laughs> so I like that book. And perhaps what I'm picking up as a theme for the panelists tonight is that it, in some ways it is an act of rebellion to show yourself as a proud disabled person in the world and to write your story and to own your space. And so there is something, um, and also good storytelling is about overcoming adversity. And even in your book, Matt, it does talk about a period of time that you became quite unwell as a teenager and really had to work hard to, to get back on into the waves again. And so, you know, I think they're really important stories to put out there that things aren't always going to be easy, but sometimes that can provide the grist to the mill. Mm. Any more questions, Leanne? Yeah, we have a question from Isabella. Um, perhaps this one's for Eliza. She asks what we can do as a community to push for streaming of live events. Uh, yeah, I think, um, yeah, just offering that as, you know, if you are going, it's a ticketed event, say, to offer it as a separate ticket. Um, so that, yeah, it's just still an option. And I, what I've been trying to tell people is that it doesn't really actually have to be an expensive thing. Um, for instance, it can be live streamed on Facebook using a phone mm -hmm. and a tripod. Um, yeah. And you can actually get like a little um, adaptable microphone that goes into your phone so that you can pick up the sound really well and you can just live stream straight onto Facebook or live stream onto Instagram um, or YouTube. Um, and then if you are going to live stream, they actually, um, you can have captions as well, which is really another great um, accessible part of social media uh and but yeah if you are going to do something a bit more ticketed you can there's so many great wonderful companies that do it do live streaming for you and take on that um and then you'd off, mm. offer that as a separate ticket choice and like matt mentioned there's more and more technology available to people that um access information in different ways i find with my son who's dyslexic he's become you know he can teach himself how a Hadron Collider works by watching YouTube clips. Yeah. So me, who's been a former book snob, you know, I've actually had to understand that there are many ways that we can access information and books is just one of those ways. Unfortunately, a lot of the technology, we talk about ticketed events, are still not accessible to people with visual impairment. They just don't work with screen readers. So a lot of our, the so if we're talking about creating opportunities with events, a lot of the parasurfing events that I go to, the international events for surfing for people with disabilities, and I can't ac I can't access the score sheet because the, the, the application is not accessible with screen readers. So there's still a long way to go with all that with that type of stuff as well, and definitely with a lot of bespoke apps and event event stuff that's beyond outside of Facebook. It's almost inaccessible for people with visual impairment using screen readers. It's good to know. Do we have time for a last question, Leanne? Uh, I think we do not. I think we might wrap things up here. But thank you so much to, to you, Sally, and to the panel for the very important conversation um, that you've shared with us today for sharing your life experience. And I think also for kind of challenging us and, and calling on us in, in our respective roles, um, whether it's in libraries, in schools, as creators and distributors of books, um, to make space for stories that represent all human experiences, including disability. Um, so, yeah, thank you so much for your sharing. And thank you also to all of our attendees who've made time with us tonight and to Australia Reads for, for partnering with us for tonight's conversation. Um, before we leave, we do want to let you know that Big Visions is available for order now through Vision Store. Um, so you can visit shop.visionaustralia.org to purchase your copy. Um, and all titles by our authors tonight, including Come Over to My House, are also available um, from Northern Books. So you can visit northernbooks.com.au if you'd like to purchase Come Over to My House um, or titles by Sally, Eliza and Andy. Um, there are a few partners that Vision Australia Library would also like to acknowledge um, here um, for working with us to bring stories from our community into the world, um, in particular Burbay Publishing, who have championed the Big Visions picture book series, um, and also our friends at Writers Victoria, who support our members in learning how to tell their own stories, um, which is so important. 
We also love working with the Melbourne Writers' Festival um, and we'll be hosting a very exciting event for the 2023 program at our Kuyong location. So keep an eye out for the soon-to-be-released Melbourne Writers' Festival program for more information on that. Um, we do also partner with a number of public libraries around the country, assisting our shared members to access our collection, which is a fully accessible collection for people with a print disability, as well as our programs and technology. Um, so if you would like more information about working with the Vision Australia Library or just information for yourself or someone you support to become a member of our library, please visit visionaustralia.org forward slash library or contact us at library at visionaustralia.org. So at the close of the webinar, you'll be directed to a short survey about tonight's conversation. And you can also indicate there if you'd like one of the Vision Australia Library team to contact you. We'll also send the link to the survey to you by email next week. So all that said, thank you again to Sally, to our panel, Matt, Andy and Eliza um, for your sharing this evening. And we wish you all a very good night. Thank you. Vision Australia. Blindness. Low vision. Opportunity. Vision Australia logo. Three navy blue ovals linked together diagonally within a bright yellow rectangle.